Hi, I'm Beryl Dakers, and we are fortunate to have the opportunity to chat with independent filmmaker Emily Harrell, producer and director of In the Bubble with Jamie, along with her subject, the one and only Jamie Harefoot. Now, this film details, I guess, behind the scenes of Jamie's campaign to unseat Lindsey Graham in 2020 as South Carolina senator. Emily, what compelled you to do this? Well, I've known Jamie almost my entire life. Uh, we're both born and raised from Orangeburg, South Carolina. And, you know, I'm sure everyone remembers in 2020, uh, Jamie really put a spotlight on South Carolina with this campaign. Everyone was talking about this race from New York to California, Maine to Florida. So many people would come up to me and be like, you know, that race in South Carolina, I know you're from South Carolina. Um, and so it just felt like a really unique opportunity to get to make a film about someone that I've known for a really long time that I admire um, and that was really doing something historic. Now, Jamie, this is a first for you as a newcomer to being a candidate. That carries with it its own weight. So why would you also allow yourself to be <laughs> the subject of a camera following you around? Well, you know, it, it was interesting. But, I, you know, Beryl, I always knew that this race had the potential of being a, a David versus Goliath story. Um, when you think about Lindsey Graham, who is a senior senator from South Carolina, um, the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, the best friend and confidant of President Donald Trump, uh, and little old me, you know, round-headed kid from Orangeburg, South Carolina, born to a teen mom, uh, first-generation college kid, but always behind the scenes, you know, state party chair working for Jim Clyburn. Uh, but we knew the, the ma raw material was there, the bones were there. And I knew that this would be an interesting race and one in which I think you, so many people could learn from. Um, and uh, it was also interesting to allow cameras to come behind the scenes, uh, to, to see me in, in a very intimate uh, fashion in terms of, you know, with my, my kids uh, uh, on the campaign trail. And then you add in the complexity of COVID um, uh, it was just interesting in so many ways, and uh, even now when I, when I look at it, uh, there's stuff that I learn about myself uh, from it, and uh, things that I hope that people uh, learn about themselves by watching it as well. Now you can't open that door without going further. What did you learn? <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> that for me, ultimately, this is not about, and I, and I always kind of knew this, but it, I saw it, like for me, this wasn't about getting another title. This really was about giving people hope. Um, and, and it's been the motivation my entire life for all the things that I've done. It's about, you know, standing up for people like my grandparents. It's about uh, being a voice for folks who don't have a voice. It, it's about trying to push a state um, to see all of its people in the way that we are meant to see all of our people, right? And so for me, that's what this was all about. And there are challenges with that. And sometimes there are challenges even on the side, people who you would think would be on your side, right? And you see that in the film as well. Um, but for me, you know, you just never give up. You always do and you always push and you always try to do the right thing. Um, and so, you know, I never have to have another political title in my life. Um, I feel like I've done and achieved so much, but I still am pushing to make life better for, for all of the people here in South Carolina and all across the country. Emily, this for you was a different kind of documentary in a sense because we're so accustomed now to reality TV and the idea that the camera is right there with the person all the time, but that wasn't the case here. Right. Um, you know, it was a global pandemic. Uh, part of the reason the film's called In the Bubble with Jamie is because uh, the campaign team did literally have a bubble that they told us about at the very beginning. Um, you know, the six foot distancing, that in 20 years, we probably won't remember what that was about, but it was a very top of mind thing in 2020. And so, you know, we at first were like, oh my goodness, how do you make a film about someone when you can't get closer than six or 12 feet? Um, and they're wearing a mask and you can't see their face, you can't see their expressions. 
Um, but I think that's when you have to kind of turn the thing that's feeling like a limit into an opportunity. Um, and so I asked Jamie if he'd film himself. We got him a little camera, um, taught him how to use it. We had like a booklet that we put together and passed it off in a plastic bag. And um, I think some of the best material, honestly, is the stuff that, mm. that Jamie filmed. You know, one thing we didn't put in the film is uh, my debate, the first debate I had with Lindsay, and I was behind the plexiglass. Uh, there are people to this day, and you know, I go all around the country in my, in my job as DNC chair, who still ask me about the plexiglass <laughs> and the debate. So much so that I think it, it influenced the vice presidential debate, because I don't know if you remember, uh, Vice President, uh, then Senator Harris, used a plexiglass divider in her debate with then Vice President Mike Pence. And her her team, or the presidential, the Biden-Harris team, asked about what we did in terms of the plexiglass divider for, for our debate. Um, but, you know, it's it's so interesting to think about where we were then and where we are now. But let's talk about you as a co-filmmaker, though. What <laughs> kinds of things were you filming of yourself, and how difficult is that? Oh, it was very difficult. Because at the time, you know, my wife and I have two boys, and we're at home. And, and one of our boys at the time was, I mean, barely over one. Um, and so, you know, she's a professor. She's teaching, and, uh, and I'm running a campaign. But, you know, she still has a work in her own career. So there were times in the campaign schedule where I had to, I'm with the kids and I'm, you know, teaching my oldest kid from home, going through his lessons. And I got the, the little one and changing diapers and everything. And he's crying. And, and then in a few minutes, I got to run downstairs because I got an interview with Stephen Colbert or Oprah or, or some donors. So, I mean, it's really this chaotic world that I'm in. And then the first few times, I recorded hours of video and didn't turn the sound off, <laughs> right? So it, it, is, it is all those things. And I remember telling him, like, oh, God, I didn't turn the sound off. But um, uh, it was very adventurous. <laughs> um, uh, and, but but it, it was interesting to be able to look back and to see some of the things we were going through and then see the moments in which I even forgot the camera was on. And you just saw the just either the jubilation or the frustration and uh, that was unfiltered. But that's what a filmmaker really wants to see, is it not? I mean, those moments when it's just forget the cameras, this is the real deal. Mm -hmm. 100 um, percent. And I think one of probably one of the moments that we're going to look back on in, in years is uh, Jamie's debate prep and the lead up to the final debate. And it's just so real and honest. Um, and when that came in, when the, you know, one of the first scenes in the film, when you're with your youngest, mm -hmm. when that came in, I was just like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. This is incredible. Um, you know, the bus tour when you're going down to Orangeburg, that yeah. is so heartfelt. Um, it's, it's triggering for me, though. I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure. But... Um, those moments, I think, really speak to humanity and speak to the universal nature of trying to just do something. Um, and just when they, you know, he'd hand me a little tiny card. That's, that's what mm -hmm. I would get. And we'd go put it into the computer. And it was really incredible. Similarly, were there moments when you said, oh, I wish I were there with him. I wish I could be there on site to do this as opposed to viewing it after the fact from a distance? I mean, of course. So like, for example, the plexiglass, we weren't there for that. So it's, I, I know it's an important moment for Jamie, but it's not something that we have documentation of. So that could have been a great moment in the film. Um, I think it's a great story, but yeah, there, part of being a documentary filmmaker is having to come to terms with missing things. Um, it's just the nature of it. Uh, but I also think, this was a really unique time for all of us to be alive and to experience, and I think what we came up with actually worked really quite well. 
Jamie, when you look back on it and you alluded to the fact that you were getting ready to do a Stephen Colbert interview, mm -hmm. we know you were on Oprah, you were on The Daily Show, you were on all of the national networks and probably international too. So how much of an impact did having all of that external, national and international attention, how much did that play on your mind as you sought to manage your campaign? I mean, for me, it, not a whole lot, other than it was an opportunity to help generate more resources into the campaign. And that's sort of how we saw those national interviews. But for me, my real focus was on, on the policies that we were trying to roll out for South Carolina. You know, I rolled out during the campaign, and we, I remember going down to uh, Orangeburg County, my home county, and uh, we were out in the big tobacco farm, uh, and we rolled out our Rural Hope Agenda. And it was about an agenda, a six-point plan on how we were going to rebuild and revitalize rural communities across South Carolina. Because I grew up off of a dirt road, and I, and I understand, you know, that many of those com small communities that were vibrant when I was a kid are no longer vibrant. They're dying. They're, they're withering on the vine. Uh, and that's because of the lack of investment. It's a lack of attention that, that has not been paid to them by some of our elected leaders. And so for me, that was the stuff that really, really got me going. You know, of course, it's, it's, it's fun to have your friends uh, or your college friends and all say, oh man, I just saw you on Colbert. I just saw you on this and that. But for me, it was really having an agenda to, to and a vision for how we could take South Carolina from being at the very bottom of all of the good lists to the very top of all of the good lists. And, and, it, and that's still part of my passion. That's still part of what I try to think about each and every day. Um, and it's just frustrating that when, when, you, when you have these ideas and you see the pain that people are going through, you see the, the, the hardships that people have and not being able to just go in and fix it. Um, and so, but that was really my focus then and it's still my focus now. We have alluded to the fact that because it was during COVID, you weren't out there doing all of the handshaking and stuff oh, yeah. of that sort. But Lindsey Graham's campaign continued with yeah. the personal appearances. How much do you think that impacted the perception of the South Carolina audiences for you, that you weren't there and what did that mean in terms of, you know, what they were getting on tape? Uh, you know, that is such a great question. And I, I think it had a, a dramatic impact. There are several things uh, that I think had, had an impact on this race because my polling and I believe Lindsey Graham's polling and the national polling was all in the same boat. I mean, it's reason why, you know, Mitch McConnell dropped $20 million in South Carolina in October. It's because everybody's polling was saying the same thing. But one of the things, particularly on the Democratic side, that is so important is that, you know, the base of our party, that that person-to-person -person connection and contact is so important. Being able to go see people and do that retail politics and go to the fish fries and go and to go, uh, you know, visit the churches and, and doing all these things. And, uh, you know, we did some of that in a limited basis, but we couldn't do it the way that we wanted to. I had this grand plan of having the most uh, the most robust field operation in the history of South Carolina. And we would have had the resources to do it. That March when COVID shut everything down, I had just approved having organizers in all 46 counties in South Carolina. And that's unprecedented. Never, ever happened uh, on our side. But we had to pull all of it down and make it all virtual because of COVID. And so not having that connection was really, really did hurt us. Um, and I learned from that lesson, and I, and I know immediately after the race, I called up Reverend Warnock and John Ossoff in Georgia, and I said, I don't care what the national people are telling you, you better go out and do some real tail politics. And I really think that was part of how we were able to pull off uh, the, the elections in Georgia in the United States Senate, because they changed how they were operating, and they went out. Um, and, and, and did the door knocking and did the retail politics that is so important in order to win. Were you arguing back 
off camera about the need to get out despite the... Uh... Well, I was very concerned because I had lost my, my grand aunt um, that July because of COVID in a nursing home, right? And she, and she died by herself uh, without family. And so I was very, and my wife and I were very cognizant that, you know, this election was important, but it was not more important than risking the lives of the voters or the people who work for us. And so, you know, a part of me now in retrospect, you say, okay, we could have done something to, to navigate COVID, but we got to remember at that time, we didn't know what COVID was and there was no vaccine, right? And all we know is that people were going to hospitals and they were dying. And so, you know, for me, it is always about putting the people first. B above my own political ambitions and everything else, it's about put putting people first. And having two young kids, I didn't want to risk the lives of my kids because of my just interest to run for an office. And I didn't want to risk the lives of the people that I, I work with or the voters themselves. And so uh, in the end, did it hurt? Probably. Uh, but would I do it the same way, given what I knew then? Probably so. One last question then. What do you want people to take away from this film? Um, that no matter who you are, you can do whatever you want and shoot for the stars. Because that's what Jamie did. And I would imagine that's the same for you. Yes, it, it really is. It's about hope. I can tell you just recently, I came through the airport and this guy flagged me down and he said, you're, you're Jamie Harrison? I said, yeah. He said, I want to show you something. And he pulled out his phone. He said, I've been holding this for, since you ran for the U.S. Senate. And there's this picture. And it's his daughter with this picture of this round-headed Charlie Brown looking character on it. And underneath it was Jamie. It just had Jamie. And she was holding it up. He said, my daughter so loved your campaign, saw all your ads on YouTube, and she promised me if I ever met you to show this to you. I can tell you there's so many, if young people could vote, <laughs> I, would be, I would be the U.S. Senator from South Carolina. But there's so many young people that I think the campaign really inspired. Uh, and so despite me not winning, I hope our campaign inspired the next U.S. Senator or the next governor from South Carolina or even the next president of the United States. Jamie Harrison, Emily Harrell, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.